Hey guys, it's Dr. Becker. Uh, I'm back this week uh, to do a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I want to talk about ear pain and pressure. And this is really important, something I'm very interested in. Uh, since the pandemic started, we haven't been seeing as much infection as we usually do. But we've definitely been seeing more ear pain and pressure. And I want to talk about that with you because I think we're all very comfortable with the idea that when our ear hurts, we might have an ear infection. Uh, a lot of us had that when we were kids and we remember that experience of um, having an ear infection and going to the pediatrician and taking antibiotics. And I think that a lot of doctors, uh, when we think about ears and ear pain, that's really the first place that our minds go to. Um, but as an ENT doctor, I think I end up seeing a lot of the patients for whom ear pain and ear pressure is a little more complicated. Uh, I think this is because if you have an infection, oftentimes you get treated uh, correctly by your primary care physician or urgent care or emergency room. But when you have ear pain or pressure that maybe isn't an infection, then it becomes a little more difficult for doctors who aren't otolaryngologists to understand and treat. So I wanna talk about that today and talk about what are some of the causes of ear pain uh, and pressure, even eustachian tube problems or eustachian tube-like symptoms that aren't actually related to infection. Um, so first, uh, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna talk about infectious causes of ear pain briefly. And then I'm gonna talk about non-infectious causes of ear symptoms, including allergy. And then I'm gonna talk about actually a really common cause of ear pain and pressure, which is musculoskeletal problems in the jaw and neck. And that's gonna include a little bit of anatomy. <laughs> so we're gonna hit the old anatomy books briefly. And I'll explain why these things happen and why they feel so much like ear pain, like there's a problem inside the ear itself. Um, so let's just start out by talking about ear infection briefly. So uh, there's two kinds of ear infections that cause pain and pressure. The first is the infection of our ear canal, um, which is sort of called swimmer's ear colloquially. We call it otitis externa. And it's basically an infection of the skin uh, inside the ear canal itself, inside the little hole that goes down to your eardrum. And that's just because your ear is uh, dark and, and, and there's things to eat in there, like body juice and dead skin and things like that. And I talk more about otitis externa in, um, uh, in my uh, video about earwax, itchy ears. But basically, otis, otitis externa is fairly easy to diagnose. It's uh, usually accompanied by drainage from the ear. Uh, usually not just scant wet stuff, that's just Q-tip symptoms, but really the um, you know sticky pus coming out of your ear, it's often accompanied by blockage of the hearing um, and, a problem, and, and some pain when you wiggle the external ear. So those are some signs that usually doctors don't, you know, like non-ENT doctors don't really miss that one. Um, the second type of infection is a type of infection more like little kids get or babies, we call it otitis externa, and that's an infection behind your eardrum. Um, that happens when the eustachian tube, which is the tube that goes between our ear and our nose, isn't functioning properly to ventilate and drain the space behind our eardrum. That little space called the middle ear can then fill up with fluid, which is just basically body juice, serous fluid, lymphatics, and then bacteria, usually from the back of our nose, can crawl up the eustachian tube grow in that fluid like a culture medium and make an infection. So by definition, in order to have that type of ear infection, you actually need to have a good amount of fluid in your ear. So kind of filled up with fluid. And usually that's the sort of thing that a doctor can see as well when they look in your ear because your eardrum will appear different, okay? So it will be, you can sometimes see a fluid line, you can see bubbles, you can see pus bulging, um, but it can be a little hard if you don't have a raging infection. Or sometimes doctors will say things like, you have a little fluid in there, or your ear looks a little red. And sometimes it's kind of hard to tell if there's infection or not uh, by looking if it's subtle. Um, one of the things though that you kind of have to have if you're gonna have an ear infection that causes pain is you have to have hearing loss in the affected ear. 
The reason is that fluid is gonna fill up the space behind your eardrum and make the eardrum hard to move. And if that happens, then you're gonna feel really blocked in that ear. I mean, very objectively blocked. Like I hold my finger over this ear and put the phone here like an old fashioned phone or anything that makes noise, a click kicking, ticking clock or whatever. And you'll actually notice the difference between your two ears. So those are two things that really help us drive toward thinking there is an infection, whether if there's drainage or if there's hearing loss in the affected ear, we think a little more about, well, that really could be an infection just based on the story alone. But then there's a lot of patients that I see who have been treated for infection because their exam was somewhat equivocal. They, you know, they, it looked sort of red or somebody said, oh, you have some fluid in there, you know, and they didn't really get better with antibiotics or drops. Um, and then they end up in our office saying, well, what the heck's wrong? And, you know, I like to tell folks, there's only two things, you know, when you treat something that you think is a diagnosis, you think, oh, I'm gonna give a patient this diagnosis and I'm gonna treat you. There's really only two things that are possible if the patient doesn't get better. The first thing is that the treatment wasn't good enough, right? You have to do something stronger, something longer, you know, something more broad spectrum. And the second possibility is that the diagnosis wasn't completely right, that there's something else we're not treating, we're not understanding, we're not getting to. So I think it's fairly easy for the ENT to know if it's the first thing. You know, if we look in and see a continued raging infection, we're like, okay, that's what it is. But if we look in and we go, I don't know, you know, the ear just doesn't look that bad. You know, there's no hearing loss. The patient's like, I hear fine, my ear just hurts, or I feel like it needs to pop. Then we're sometimes dealing with something else. And that is the big thing I wanna talk about today, which is other causes of ear pain. First of all, there's one that's relatively rare that happens usually in older people, and that is shingles. Uh, shingles can cause terrible, long-lasting, deep, sometimes severe ear pain. So that was that was one we don't really wanna miss. Um, so it's not very common, uh, but I have to put it out there. The second is migraine variant. So there is some suggestion in the literature that some people actually get headaches in the deep portions of their ear and the nerves that go to the ear and jaw. And some of those people may actually be misdiagnosed as having a problem with the jaw joint and muscles. So with those two caveats, I wanna jump right into what I think is at least probably, at least the cause of half of cases of adult ear pain. And that is problems with the jaw muscles and upper neck. Now, I just wanna say in the modern era, especially in 2020, um, the contributing factors to this uh, syndrome, we'll call it, are much more common than they were even two years ago. And there's two reasons why. The first is that we're all on our screens more. We're looking at our phones, we're on our laptops, we're lying in bed trying to work from home and all these other crazy postures with our head and neck that don't keep our head over our neck. Boom. And right where our neck meets our head is our ear. So the muscles around the jaw and neck here can become very out of joint, very imbalanced. Um, you can have a lot of problems with malrotation of our upper spine. And um, these pull on the jaw muscles in weird ways to create inflammation and pain. The second thing is we have a lot more anxiety than we used to even a few years ago. The events of the past few years um, have really disrupted the life of humans on the planet. And I think that even people who didn't have uh, you know, problems with muscular tension in their neck and jaw are having it now. So we're seeing a lot of uh, problems with um, inflammation of this area of the body. People coming in and saying, I feel like my ears need to pop. I get earaches sometimes. I have to, I keep trying to pop my ears or stretch my ears out, um, or they just have earaches. And I think that there are some contributing factors right now that are making that more common. So if you're one of those people, you're definitely not alone. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that pain is there and what we can do about it, okay? Okay, it's time for an anatomy lesson. Here we go, here's my old Netter Anatomy book. So, ooh, sorry people. So we're gonna look at, uh, oh, that was crazy. So we're gonna look at this uh, picture right now. This is a picture of um, a skull with a part of the um, jawbone ha having been sawed off. And I'll just get you oriented. 
This here is the hole in the ear that is the um, external ear canal. So that's where the sound would go in. And then deeper behind here, this, this is actually the jaw bone and the jaw joint. And then behind this, if you were to go deeper, is actually where the eardrum is. And then the middle ear is in here. And then that eustachian tube comes down and is going to come in, you know, basically in the back of the nose somewhere uh, back in this area. So running right along this eustachian tube, right behind this um, uh, is the eustachian tube. And right in front of it, right here underneath your jawbone, but in between your jawbone and your eustachian tube is this giant muscle here called your medial pterygoid. And then here's the other one here. Here's uh, the, the, other, uh, the, other, the other pterygoid. And these are, these are very, very strong muscles um, that control your jaw. So these are um, incredibly, uh, they're actually in what, some of the strongest muscles of your body. And if you ever clench or grind your teeth, these muscles are going to be activated. If we look at a little bit of a more difficult view right below that, here, this is a look at the underneath of the jaw. So you're looking forward at the jawbone. Here's those big strong muscles that work the jaw. And what you can see is where they attach up inside your skull at your skull base is right next to the orifice of your eustachian tube into the back of your nose. So you can see that these, these muscles here, which are underneath the jawbone, are very much in the deep part of the ear, very intricately related to the eustachian tube itself and to the bones that surround uh, the actual ear itself. So when these muscles are active or inflamed, the tendons tend to get like a tendonitis and then these tendons will be quite painful, all right? And people will say, well, it's not my jaw that hurts. It's actually inside, deep inside my ear. And you can see that this is not the jaw at all. It's actually inside, right next to the structures of the ear. And in fact, some of this inflammation can even transfer to the eustachian tube itself and cause the eustachian tube to have trouble clearing. So the question is what to do about it, all right? So when the ear is having trouble clearing, there's really two, um, there's two things that we think about. We first, we think about allergy. Could the eustachian tube be swollen because the nose is stuffy, things like that? A lot of doctors have already treated that by the time patients come to see us. They've been on a nasal spray like Flonase, they've been on some Sudafed, maybe an over-the-counter antihistamine like Claritin, Zyrtec, or Allegra. And if it was really a lot about that, uh, usually the patient knows it. They have a stuffy nose. It's their allergy season. They recently had a cold. And these medications will have helped uh, patients who have had, uh, you know, the lining of their nose and ears being swollen from allergies. But again, a lot of patients come in befuddled because those treatments haven't worked. And in fact, they'll say, well, I've never really had allergies and I don't really have sinus problems. And Sudafed is not doing anything for me. So we really, in those patients, think too about could it be the muscular uh, system of the jaw and neck that are causing problems? Now, I'll tell you something about that. A lot of people uh, clench and grind their teeth and don't know it. This is a very, very common behavior at night, especially during times of stress. Um, and when that happens, those muscles are gonna become tight and inflamed. The biggest place where people will have pain with that is right under the jaw where those pterygoid muscles attach to the skull base. That ligament that attaches, or tendon rather, that attaches the bone right there becomes extremely tender. The joint itself can be tender. Usually if I put the speculum in and people go, ow, then I, I know it's, it's off in the jaw joint itself. Sometimes it goes into the temple or the face. It can cause cheek pain. Facial pressure along the buttress from biting right there. It kind of pinches and puts a lot of pressure through the face. And then again, it'll actually sometimes come around and the inflammation will even spread into the muscles of the upper neck including the scalene and sometimes even the sternocleidomastoid, which is the big muscle that goes all the way down here. So when we first see someone like that, it's actually fairly easy to make that diagnosis because all these muscles, at least some portion of them, will be very, very tender on the affected side and not on the unaffected side. So when we see that, we know we have to use some anti-inflammatories. We start with some NSAID usually, like ibuprofen, if a patient can take them. We'll sometimes even use a steroid anti-inflammatory like methylprednisolone or a brief course of prednisone, just briefly, maybe say for a week. And then we sometimes, again, if a patient can tolerate, we'll use a muscle relaxant like Flexeril uh, to kind of help reduce some of the spasm of the muscles and some of the inflammation. 
At the same time, we have to think about the behavior. We have to assume that many of you may be clenching or grinding your teeth in your sleep and really should wear a mouth guard at night to stop, to help stop the behavior and cushion the um, trauma to the muscles and to your teeth and to your jaw bones, both upper and lower. So getting an over-the-counter mouth guard is something that you can do today to help mitigate some of that. Obviously talking to your dentist is an even better idea, but if you're looking for some quicker relief, we often suggest that you just go to the local pharmacy and get a mouth guard that's designed for people who clench or grind their teeth at night. They're about $20. Um, I like the kind that go over the back teeth, not the front ones. Something that's really gonna get you into occlusion in those back teeth. It's like wearing a splint on a, you know, on your wrist uh, if you sleep weird. You know, you, you, it's just something that holds everything in place. And then after that, we try to think about how we can get the game changed for the patient. So in addition to the mouth guard, we think about maybe uh, getting a patient into some physical therapy for massage, for manipulation, for postural retraining. So we're not doing the things with our neck that we're not supposed to do. Um, we learn how to stretch our jaw and neck. We learn how to self-massage um, and a few strengthening exercises to improve, for instance, the head posture, strengthen the posterior neck muscles. So that's kind of my armamentarium for treating non-infectious ear pain, which is probably about half of the adult ear pain that we see in ENT practice. So I hope this was helpful understanding why, um, how you can have ear pain that's not an infection. And uh, please feel free to, you know, send me some comments if there's anything else you want to know about that. And I hope this was helpful. Okay, bye.